Good morning, guys and girls. Um, I hope all is well in, uh, in the middle of Russia where you are. Um, I'm talking to you, of course, from Sydney in Australia, where we've just had a massive electrical storm. Um, my internet was down. I was panicking. I thought I wasn't going to be able to, to communicate. But uh, it's just come back up again so we can have a, a bit of a, a chat. So uh, you can hear me OK? Yeah, we hear you well and uh, everything good. I think you can go. Yeah, great. Okie doke. All right. What we're going to talk about today is uh, effective communication. And I know that the name of that presentation is probably a bit boring. You go, oh, gosh, this is going to be a boring presentation. But I can promise you it's not. What I'm going to tell you today is, is a, a good story about poor communication or lack of communication uh, between engineers uh, and a catastrophic result. Um, I'm a little older than you guys, but when I was about your age, there was stuff happening in Formula One, which was worth reporting. So we'll talk about that in due, in due course. Um, to start off with, the personality profile of engineers tends towards being uh, introverts, uh, introspective people. Now, this is not a bad thing because uh, an introverted person is someone who's not easily distracted. They sit down and, uh, and do their job. Uh, if I asked for a show of hands, I'm sure I'd get a show of hands. If I asked how many of you people have been guilty of saying something like, leave me alone, I know what I'm doing, you know, like Kimi Raikkonen. Okay, um, that's because that's your, you know, whereas an introvert or extrovert rather, the other side, um, they might want to sit up and talk about it and get distracted and whatever. Um, unfortunately, the downside is that introverts don't tend to be good communicators. And the result of that can be, well, can be catastrophic. So, what I'm going to talk about today is that uh, in your career as um, as engineers, where, where you're headed or whatever, you need to be able to communicate clearly and succinctly uh, and not expect people to understand without having it explained to them. Some people aren't as bright as you. And of course, the best way to do that is to keep notes. Uh, you know, that's, that's the, the way it goes. The other good thing about keeping notes, of course, is that it helps you uh, with the, your design report for the competition. And it also helps when you're passing the information on to the next generation, your knowledge transfer. Uh, knowledge transfer is hugely, hugely important. Otherwise, every year it's just another new team. Okay, I've said that. That's, you know, pardon the extroverts and the introverts. I, I tend to think of extroverts as being transmitters and introverts as being receivers. You know, the one lot talk and the other lot listen. Um, there's room in this world for both of them. In most cases, um, uh, engineers are not um, are not uh, extroverted. Generally, uh, drivers and whatever they're not extroverts either. The classic example, of course, being Kimi Raikkonen's. You know, a couple of years ago, when he was in the lead of a Grand Prix, and his engineers started to tell him about what he should do to hold the lead, and he just said, "Look, just leave me alone. I know what I'm doing," and went on to win the race. Of course, you've also seen interviews, I'm sure, with, uh, with Kimi, where a long, complicated question is asked, and the answer is, mm, that's Kimi. Okay, here's something else you've seen. I followed the instructions, but you know, how often have you heard those words? Whose fault is that? The fault there is always that the communication of ideas or instructions was not good, and the receiver couldn't uh, couldn't sort out what the what the instruction actually was important okay um, that's Mark Twain a famous old author from many many years ago and one of his wise words was that the best way to predict the future is to look to the past and those words from Mark Twain are my excuse today for talking about historical matters as I said when I was about your age, 
uh, there were things happening in Formula One, uh, which, oh, it, interesting, but predictably, we're going to talk about this communication issue. Okay, George Santayana, a Spaniard, he agreed with them and he wrote these immortal words, that those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So if you don't write things down, it gets forgotten and the team make the same mistakes again and again. But I'll give you a little tip from Pat. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes than to learn from your own mistakes. Let other people do the hard work and make the mistakes and you'll learn from them and don't make those mistakes. Um, to do that, you do need to have a little bit of an interest in the history of what you're doing. So if you're looking for ideas or inspiration uh, for your new formula student car, uh, the answer probably doesn't lie in looking at all the other cars around you. Um, you know, monkey see, monkey do means that everybody just ends up the same and you're only as good as whatever else there is out there. We're trying to, we're trying to get better. And to do that, you need to start to think outside the box and think of other solutions. And there are lots of other solutions. But if you start to do this, thinking outside the box and coming up with, uh, you know, exciting or different ideas, they need to be discussed. They need to be talked about. The communication needs to be between the team uh, to determine whether you actually want to do this or not, which is a pretty good lead into the story I'm going to tell you today. Okay. Um, as I said, this story underlines what can happen when there is a communication breakdown. Okay. The theme for Formula Student is motorsport. So we're going to look at a classic case of communication failures at the highest level of motorsport that led to a tragic conclusion. So we're talking now about Formula One and we're talking about the year 1970. The Austrian driver Jochen Rindt was the world champion driver in 1970. Unfortunately, he didn't live to be crowned. On September the 15th, 1970, I was 24 then. Um, so, you know, generally the same sort of age as you guys. Jochen Rindt was killed in qualifying at the Italian Grand Prix when his Lotus crashed at the Curva Parabolica. I think they call it the Curva Patrese these days. It's ch they've changed the name. Okay, that's, that's the car. That car was radical at the time. That was stunning. That's the famous Lotus uh, 72. Uh, it ended up being a very, very successful race car in its day. Um, however, on the 5th of September, it wasn't so successful. Okay, Ritt raced in Formula One for four years. Um, he wasn't an engineering type or a mechanical type. Uh, he was an introverted person. Uh, he started off driving for the Cooper team, which was a, a, a medium level team. He moved on to the Brabham team at that team who were, they'd been world champions in 67 and 68. 66 and 67 rather. So they, they, were, they were a top level team, but he was convinced that he needed to move to the Lotus team. Uh, and he joined that team in 1969. Now, Lotus were seen as a team that had cars that were at the leading edge, cutting edge, incredibly uh, uh, competitive, uh, probably the fastest things out there. But unfortunately, they had a, uh, a very poor reputation for reliability and safety. And, uh, you know, several drivers had been killed in recent years before this, driving Lotuses at various places, uh, including Indy 500 and Hockenheim and, and other places. So it was a bit of a leap of faith by Jochen Rindt to move to the Lotus team. And to have to deal with their team principal, who is Colin Chapman. There's a photograph there you can see. That's Rent, of course, sitting in the chair. Chapman sitting on the ground, scratching his ankle. Um, Chapman was a dictator, a very, very much an extrovert, a transmitter, not a receiver. 
And he was a big ideas man, like a big picture man. So he would come up with these great ideas and despite the complication or whatever, would pass on the, re the responsibility for the design and construction to his engineers or designers or whatever he had working for him. Um, and then wouldn't discuss it with them. So when people came back uh, and said, oh, you know, there's problems doing this, that, or the other, usually they got yelled at. Um, I'll give you some ex ex uh, examples of that. As I've said, Chapman was a visionary engineer. Some people consider him a saint. They reckon he was the smartest man ever in Formula One. I certainly don't have respect for him, um, even though I do respect his, his vision as an engineer. His insistence on lightweight construction gave Lotus cars a reputation as being fast but fragile. His uh, slogan was um, simplificate and add lightness. In other words, make the thing as simple as possible and as light as possible. And that was his driving, his driving uh, mantra. Okay, an example of this, this is, in, this is from 1969, the year before. And this is the earlier model Lotus Formula One car. Jochen Rint is the driver. You can see those high mounted wings, front and back, both mounted on the suspension. And uh, this was the discovery of uh, aerodynamic downforce in motor racing. This was the first year that that was discovered. Came the first Grand Prix, the French Grand Prix that year, we saw little wings and then they just sprouted. And Chapman had this idea, great, we'll put the suspension loads directly into the tires, not into the chassis. We'll stick the wings way up in the air out of the, um, out of the, the, the airstream, uh, out of the turbulence from the, from the chassis. And sure enough, those cars, they went fast. They also had a kind of a drag reduction system where they were able to tilt the wings. You can see a little mechanism on the front edge of them. They're able to tilt the wings or flatten the wings for more or less downforce. But if you look at that with an engineer's eye, can you see any form of triangulation or support for the, uh, for the uprights? Mm, I didn't think you did. Okay. Rint had found driving these Lotus, they were fast, but they were fragile. And at the Spanish Grand Prix in 69, he had a massive crash when the rear wings collapsed on not just his car, but both team cars. Um, despite injury and his concern about Lotus fragility, there's a letter from him that I'll show in a future slide. Chapman convinced him to stay with, with the team because there's a promise of a new supercar for 1970. And so Rint, possibly against his better judgment, decided to stay on for another year. Now, at the Spanish Grand Prix, the second driver, Graham Hill, a two-time, yeah, two-time world champion, came over the crest of that hill that you can see in the background. The wing collapsed. You can see the collapsed wing folded up behind the car, and the car went out of control and crashed into the barrier. Okay. The reason the wing collapsed, apart from the stuff that we've already discussed, was that Chapman had arrived at the track, asked the race engineers, how are we going? The response was, oh, just maybe just not, not quite there, the, you know. So Chapman immediately said, make the wings bigger. So they ins instructed the team to extend those big rear wings by one foot, that's 300 millimeters each side. Of course, that overloaded the whole thing and they collapsed. Now, 11 laps later, Jochen Rint arrives at the same scene. Kaboom, rear wing collapses. You can see it collapsed. You can see the end fall down. You can even see on the outside of that where the extension was put in to extend the wings. So the wing collapsed and York and Rint had an almighty crash um, to the point where you'll see on the left-hand side, that's uh, Graham Hill. And so they're trying to help York and Rint out of the smashed up car. Now, what's important about this is that this happened 11 laps after Hill's crash. Did they warn York and Rint? Did they give him a sign from the pits? Did they call him in? Did they ask to inspect his wings? Nope. They just let it happen. Uh, Chapman just let it happen. And uh, the result, as you can see, was, was quite catastrophic. And I had some ongoing, 
ongoing effects. Um, let me just see where I am. Yeah. There's a slide in the wrong place. Oh, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll get that. Okay. Um, at this stage, pretty disillusioned with the Lotus. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd had a few failures. He wrote to Chapman, who was actually in Indianapolis at the time, because the, they had also uh, had some cars, three cars running at the Indy 500, which was on the next weekend. Um, expressed his concerns about the car. And it was obvious he was having, he was having second thoughts about driving Lotus cars for Colin Chapman. Well, not if he wanted to survive. Racing in those days was a very dangerous occupation. And, and I'll show you his letter or I'll read the letter for you. Um, it says, I just got back from Geneva. I'm going to have a second opinion on the state of my head tomorrow because he broke, he had a skull fracture and a jaw fracture and various other things. Personally, I feel very weak and ill. I still have to lay down most of the day. After seeing the doctor and hearing his opinion, we can make a final decision on Monaco and Indianapolis. So Monaco Grand Prix was uh, the next Grand Prix and Indianapolis was the same weekend. I got a hold of this incredible picture, which pretty much explains the accident. I didn't know it would fly that high. Robin Hurd, Robin Hurd was another Formula One designer for the March team. Uh, he apparently saw the wing go, but didn't see the accident as it happened around the corner. The photograph he's talking about, of course, is that one. Um, The letter goes on, it says, now to the whole situation, Colin. I've been racing Formula One for five years and I've made one mistake. I rammed Chris Amon at Claremont Ferrand and I have had one accident at Sandvoort due to a gear selection failure. Otherwise, I managed to stay out of trouble. This situation changed rapidly since I joined your team. Levin, which is in New Zealand, he had a, a crash due to a, a suspension failure. Uh, the Eiffel race, Formula Two, where wishbones failed. And now Barcelona. Honestly, your cars are so quick, they would still be competitive with a few extra pounds just to make the weakest part stronger. On top of this, you ought to spend some time checking that your different employees are, what your different employees are doing. I'm sure the wishbones on the Formula 2 car would have looked very different. Please give my suggestions some thought. I can only drive a car in which I have some confidence, and I feel the point of no confidence is quite near. So clearly at this stage, Rint is considering leaving the, uh, the Lotus team. There've been failures left, right and center. Uh, Chapman being the dictator, dictatorial manager and poor communicator that it was, would just give instructions to do something, but with no guidance as to how to do it. Uh, he alludes to that when he talks about the Formula 2 wishbones that, you know, you don't see what you can, there, you know, if the instruction is make wishbones for the Formula 2 car, uh, well, you know, the, the load path and the, the welding and the construction is left up to mechanics who may certainly not stress engineers or whatever. So anyway, we shall move along and we shall talk about, oops, let's have a look. Yeah. So I've said, okay, so the response from Chapman was to tell promised that he'd have tighter management control in the future. And to keep Rint at Lotus, he revealed plans for the radical new Lotus Model 72, which would be released for the 1970 season. Um, you can see there, that's a, a, a picture of Rint and Chapman together. Uh, the faces tell the story, don't they? Okay. That's, uh, that's out of place too. These, these slides have got mixed up, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, there's, okay. So there's the, there's the, seven, the Lotus 72 uh, in a cutaway drawing. Um, it had a lot of radical new ideas. There was, a, remember we were at the forefront of aerodynamics. The high wings had been banned after the Barcelona disaster, the high wings were banned. So the car has uh, an aero package more like we see today with a front front and rear wing. Um, the car had a wedge shape uh, to generate downforce. Uh, 
and centrally mounted radiators. So, you know, they were obviously paying some attention to reducing the, 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 the moment of inertia. Uh, the fuel tank was in between the drivers, back of the driver's seat and the engine. So to centralize the mass. But it had basically a, a whole list of radical ideas that Chapman thought were good ideas. He instructed the designer. The designer was a, 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 an ex-aviation uh, designer by the name of Maurice Philippe. Um, do this, do that, do the other. I want, I, want, I want a car. I want a wedge shape. I want to move the radiators to the middle, tank in the middle of the car, uh, the engine and transmission to be a stress member. So there's no chassis behind the roll hoop. The engine carries all the loads from the rear suspension, brakes and drive and whatever. Uh, now, understanding the need to maintain the aerodynamic uh, efficiency of the car, they understood that it was necessary to keep its attitude. You know, you look at the new Formula One cars and they talk about rake and all that sort of stuff. But we're talking about the same thing here. They wanted to keep the attitude of the car passing through the air constant. So it simply was given 100% anti-dive at the front and 100% anti-squat in the rear. Now, anti-dive, particularly at the front, requires some energy input from the brakes in the wheels to make things work. However, this car, to reduce the unsprung weight, Chapman has said, will mount the brakes inboard. And you can see on this picture that the, the brakes are actually mounted inboard in the chassis. At the back, the brakes are also mounted inboard. Uh, so they, they took a step into the unknown, but no explanation, no, uh, no discussion back and forth. Uh, why do you want to do that? Is it a good idea? You know, just Chapman dictatorial management, do it. So they, they did it. You know, uh, that's the way it was designed. So what happened from there? Well, what happened from there? There's a cutaway drawing of the car. You can actually see, if you have a look at the, at the front suspension, you can actually see the radical anti-dive angle in that cutaway. The top wishbone is sloped down significantly at the front edge. It's harder to see the back, but uh, the, the back was basically the other way around. Okay, there's the car on the track. So Maurice Philippe designed a radical wedge-shaped car in an effort to generate some aero downforce. They didn't understand. This was before the days of Venturi uh, under, under car aerodynamics, downforce, ground effect that had not been discovered at this age. Remember, this is 50 years ago. Um, all the observers, including me, were enthusiastic about it. We thought, whoa, this is the, this is the great leap forward. We've never seen anything like this in our lives. You'll notice looking at that picture too, this was before the advent of slick tires. Okay, it was finally raced at the Spanish Grand Prix in April 1970, a year after the, 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 the issues with the wings here before. And it was delayed because testing had highlighted many, many issues, stuff that they hadn't thought about. The design had focused totally on the aero aspects of the car to keep this wedge traveling straight and level through the air. Uh, but the result was the car was extremely difficult to drive at the limit. So difficult to drive the limit that Rent simply refused to do so. Uh, there you see uh, that there's Maurice Philippe standing with the car on its release. And uh, as I said, the car is designed with 100% anti-dive and 100% anti-squat. Okay. Um, to, oops, give you a... a a bit of an understanding. This is this is the design of the car. You can see how the front uh, the front wishbones are out angled down, and so the line of pitch actually goes passes through the center of gravity. So there is no transfer to the front that passes through the springs. It all passes through the suspension in. Uh, in the tension or compression of the, of the wishbones. And in essence, it locks up the front suspension. Now, what happens when you do that is that you take away any feeling from the driver. The driver needs to feel 
what the tires are doing on the road, particularly if he's trail braking. By trail braking, I mean braking into the corner. So braking, braking and turning at the same time. Right, uh, at the back, the opposite situation, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 car couldn't squat coming over corner. And that meant that it had no compliance and had traction problems coming off the corner. Uh, in other words, uh, the way they had incorporated anti-dive and anti-squat was extremely crude, not like we do it today, that we do it very different today. But uh, in those days, as I said, this was leading edge technology in those days, and they'd done it all wrong. Okay, as I said, Rint wasn't impressed. He wouldn't drive the car. So he left the development to his teammate, John Miles. Now, we saw that his teammate the previous year had been uh, Graham Hill. Well, Graham Hill, unfortunately, was very badly injured in a Lotus at the last Grand Prix in 1969 and couldn't drive in 1970. So uh, John Miles, uh, who was another extremely skillful driver, was written into the team to, uh, to help develop the car. Now, the difference with John Miles is that John Miles was actually a, uh, a qualified mechanical engineer. He knew what was going on. He could understand it. And so he got the job of trying to develop the car. So they brought out a, 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 an A model of the car. So that, this was the Lotus Type 72. They brought out a Type 72A, which removed the anti-dive. Then they brought out a Type 72B, which removed the anti-squat and did various other changes to the car along the way. All this being managed effectively with uh, communication back and forth between uh, Miles, Chapman, and, uh, and, uh, and the designer. Um, okay. In an early test, when they were testing the car, um, he expressed concern about the suspension integrity at an early test. He felt that uh, transferring all of the, the weight transfer from being carried by the front springs to being carried by the suspension links wasn't really a good idea. So Chapman told him, this is at a, at a, a track near Lotus, this before the car was raced. What I want you to do is to accelerate to top speed and then brake as hard as possible. And a bottom wishbone broke. Then he simply told the mechanics, well, just make another set, one gauge thicker, and test again, and walked away. Like, no communication. There was no uh, review of why it broke, where it broke, how it broke, what was needed, and certainly no addressing of the, the fundamental cause of the failure to start with, which was 100% crude 100% anti-dive. So that tells you quite a bit about Chapman's uh, way of doing things. Uh, my way or the highway, as they say, and that gets even harder. Okay, so then we say, why did Rint crash? There's Jochen Rint hitting the fence in Monaco. What do you see missing? No wings on the car. Mm, okay, we'll get back to that. Uh, the orange car in the left-hand side that was following up at the time, that's the New Zealand driver, Dennis Hulme. He was the 1968, 68? 60, 67 world champion. So no fool. Okay. He wrote, Dennis Hume wrote, 68 world champion, sorry. I followed Jochen down to the Parabolica. He was going very fast and waited till about 200 meters to break. The car just turned left and went into the guardrail. Something broke. Okay, let's go back to 69. Lotus were overstretched with the Formula One and Indy cars and getting the, the, the Europa into production. They, de they designed and built three four-wheel drive uh, special Indy cars at the same time as the Lotus 70, uh, the same designer, the same crew. They were also trying to get a production car. So they were overloaded, overstretched for a small company. And as a result, communication fell by the wayside. People were, you know, almost doing whatever they thought. 
And as I've said, this is an environment, if you overload yourself, you take on too much, shortcuts are taken and mistakes are made. Philippe had seen an opportunity to reduce the unsprung weight by mounting the brakes inboard on the 72. Strictly speaking, that statement is not quite right. Maurice Philippe designed inboard brakes on the Type 72 because Colin Chapman told him to reduce the unsprung weight, put the brakes on the chassis like the old Mercedes had in 1960, 55 or something. Okay, here's the front of the car. You can see the monocoque finishes the painted section at the top of the picture. And then there's a very simple square section space frame, which is attached to the front of that. And in the front of that, you can see there is a, a carrier that carries a, a, an axle, if you like. Uh, the front brakes are mounted in there. And then there are drive shafts that drive out to the front wheels, brake shafts. Uh, the wishbones pivot on this subframe, which looks a bit flimsy to me. Uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, out the front, you can see the fire suppression and the uh, master cylinders and the battery. But the bits that we're interested in are the drive shafts and, uh, and uh, uh, inboard brakes and, and suspension. So that's the front. That's the front of the 72. OK, so the inboard brakes required a shaft from the front hubs is similar to the drive shaft. So Philippe specified that these shafts should be hollow for all the right reasons. I'm sure I don't need to explain to you why you would um, why you would drill a shaft, make a shaft hollow, uh, you know, reduce the weight. But yeah. However, communication failure. Nobody checked that the machine shop could actually gun drill the shafts. So what happened? The machine shop unable to drill right through the shaft, so they drilled from each end. Nobody referred the problem back to. Uh, back to the, the drawing shop, the drawing office. Uh, they just, first of all, they probably didn't want Chapman yelling at them, do what you're told. Um, the, the, they, were, they were busy, everyone was busy. They mis the mismatched holes generated a stress riser. And I say that you young engineers sitting out there probably have a pretty good idea where this is going. Okay. Uh, that's another another drawing or another picture of the front end of the uh, of the the Lotus seventy two suspension. Oh, right. Okay, as I said earlier, the inboard brakes made it impossible to harness any of the brake torque to assist with anti dive. Instead, the wish wishbones were crudely angled to drive the front wheels forward under braking. This left the car with a very wooden feeling to drive and with very odd handling characteristics. Okay, 72B, 72C left, and the rushed revision of the car into the new versions left plenty of opportunities for things to go wrong because many of these revisions were just somebody pointing at something and saying, hey, we got to take that anti-dive out, so we need to move the, uh, move the front pickup point down or whatever the hell it was they did. And the mechanics just went ahead and did whatever they did. As I've said here, some of those modifications needed to remove the antis could not be described as good engineering practice. I haven't got a picture of it here, but interestingly, the rear radius, upper rear radius arm on the back of the car, in order to get the geometry to uh, take out some of the anti squat in the back of the car, they couldn't attach, they couldn't feed the force any way into the chassis at all. So what they did was they made a sheet metal weld mint that bolted to the cam covers on the engine that attached to the uh, attached to the radius arm uh, like just looking at it you could see compliance and failure was looking for a place to happen okay i put that picture in for another reason anti dive is pro lift an anti-squat is also a pro-lift. You can see there is the driver. That's Jochen Rint in the car at an earlier Grand Prix. As he accelerates, look how high off the ground the thing's lifted in the front. You can also see there the angle of the, uh, the anti-dive uh, at the front, the front upper wishbones. This is before the car was modified. Yay. 
Anyway, following the modifications, the car actually became very competitive and Rint won the next four Grand Prix on the trot and took the points lead in the World Championship. So it is fast. We knew it was fast. And once it was developed, it was blindingly fast. And Rint was arguably the fastest driver of his generation. However, as I've said, all was not well. At the Austrian Grand Prix, which is the Grand Prix before Italy, two weeks before, teammate John Miles had a front brake shaft failure. Okay, the car, he, the car went off the track and crashed, but fortunately, the damage wasn't so severe and Miles was not hurt. However, in his own words, in his report was, the inboard brakes were served by shafts running from the hubs to the brakes, and to save weight, these were hollow. What they did was to drill them from each end until the drilled holes met in the middle. Because, don't get me going on this, they didn't have a drill long enough to go all the way through. And of course, the holes didn't quite meet quite cleanly. So that's where the weak point was. And when I hit the brakes, the shaft broke. Okay, so now this weak point in the braking system has been identified. The engineer driver has pointed it out, reported what's going on. What do they do about it? In a word, nothing. For reasons we don't understand, the brake shafts were not changed before Monza. In hindsight, this is actually criminal negligence. John Miles, a qualified engineer, had already identified the cause of the failure in his car in Austria two weeks earlier, but it was never reported back to the factory. In those days, the teams would not have gone back to the factory. They would have gone directly from uh, from uh, uh, Austria to to Italy for the for the Grand Prix at Monza. Uh, but a simple phone call surely would have uh, would have uh, arranged to have some shafts, even if they were solid shafts. It would have avoided the uh, the stress riser that had been put into them. So, as I said, criminal negligence. Like somebody should be nailed to the wall for that. Now. The cars weren't quite fast enough because of the drag of the shape of the car and the wings that were on the car. So Chapman decided that he wanted to run the cars at Monaco without the wings. In those days, uh, sorry, at Monza without the wings. In those days, Monza was not quite the same as it is today because it didn't have the variantes or the, or the, uh, the, the chicanes that are in the track now to slow down the long straights. So it was ferociously fast track really fast track. Uh, the cars were slow down the straight. And so Chapman said, right, off with the wings. Miles found his car unstable and refused to drive it in that state. Firstly, it's got dodgy brake shafts. Secondly, it was unstable without the wings. And he was promptly sacked by Chapman. Chapman said, you drive it or you're out of here. Rint did practice the car, but found it difficult to drive, but it was almost 20 kilometers an hour faster on the straights without the wings. So what do you think of that picture? There's Colin Chapman on the left-hand side telling John Miles, drive it or piss off, pardon the French. Miles looks like he's stunned. He's just been sacked. And sitting in the background is Jochen Rint. Remember, at this stage, he has about one hour to live. Jochen Rint sitting in the background thinking, what the hell is going on here? It was a poisonous, rotten place to be. Um, and as I said, that was the end of John Miles' career. Uh, he'd had enough of Formula One. That was, uh, all the, oops. Yeah, he'd had enough of Formula One. Uh, certainly had enough of Lotus. But he was gone. But uh, that picture tells a thousand. Pictures, they say pictures were a thousand words. Well, that one sure is. Okay. On the fifth lap of qualifying, the right-hand shaft failed for on Rint's car and the car pitched into the barrier. The left-hand front wheel dropped into a hole and ripped the front subframe clean off the chassis. Remember that dodgy subframe we looked at? Rint submarine down into the car and suffered terminal injuries. Remember, they were doing like at least 150 miles an hour, so you know, 200, 250 kilometers an hour or more, the car's gone into the fence and there were problems there too. 
So he subframed down, he submarine down into the car and suffered terminal injuries. Um, there's the broken, that's the picture taken at the scene. And you can see the broken brake shaft. That's the brake disc on the ground. The broken shaft that you can see at the top end of the shaft there, that's, uh, that's the end that goes into the hub, into the hub by the wheel. Um, that's the hub end. You can see, like you can see quite clearly where the, where the, where the, where the stress riser has broken, broken the wheel and the shaft has failed. These pictures incidentally took an enormous amount of research to find. Yep, there's a classic torsional failure of the hollow brake shaft. Okay, so who is to blame? Uh, oh, lots of people were to blame, and the, but the common denominator was serial communication failure. The failure to communicate, the failure to write notes, the failure to give feedback, the failure, particularly the failure of, of the manager, the boss, Chapman, to direct his people to act on these reports or, or this communication. But I guess if the communication is not there, you can't act on it. So in the next few slides, we'll have a look at what, what's involved here, what's going on. Okay, as I said, so who is to blame? Colin Chapman? Well, yes. Without a doubt, he was the uh, he was the um, the villain of the piece. Um, it wasn't the first driver he'd lost, and it certainly wasn't the last. Um, interestingly, a little parallel story. Whilst all this was going on, um, when uh, when Rint wrote the letter to to Chapman. Uh, complaining of the, the fragility of the cars. Chapman was actually in Indianapolis where they were preparing for the Indy 500. They had made a, let's see if I can go back and find it way back. They had made a special Indianapolis car. They built three of them, designed and built three of them. Maurice Philippe had done it, this car here. This is a four wheel drive car, turbocharged Indianapolis racer. Um, when they got it to Indianapolis, the Indianapolis regulars said, Mr. Chapman, I don't think you understand the forces that are imposed on the banking on the extremely high speed corners in Indianapolis. And we don't think the suspension and uh, rolling componentry is quite strong enough for the job. Uh, you've made it too light. Remember his fixation with keeping things light. So there were three cars, they were to be driven in the event by Jochen Rint, by Graham Hill, and by the famous American racer, Mario Andretti. Uh, in practice, Mario Andretti had either a hub or an upright failure, crashed into the wall, the car caught fire, and Mario Andretti was hurt, but not seriously, fortunately. Um, the Americans sort of looked and said, told you so. So the team then uh, had all of the suspension hubs and uprights. Every hub and upright they had, like three cars plus all the spares, every single one of them was cracked and going to fail. They were just not enough for the job. Uh, Chapman said, oh, but they worked perfectly well somewhere else. Well, they didn't work perfectly well there. And so they had to actually withdraw from the Indy 500. Um, Andretti got into a backup car and uh, went on and won the race. Won the race by a couple of laps, I think. But the, the situation really was that, again, another indication of just making things too light, too, too spindly, too, yeah, too weak. Taking drivers' lives into uh, too, too lightly. Okay, so we've looked at these. Okay. Was it the designers? Now there were three designers uh, allocated to the car. Chapman's on the left in the cap. The guy in the middle's name is Tony Rudd. Tony Rudd, very respected uh, uh, race car engineer and designer from way back, way back in the fifties. But Tony Rudd was more of the um, the race engineer or the like the race manager rather than a car designer. But Tony Rudd certainly oversaw 
some of the field modifications were done to the car. The guy on the right-hand side with the beard, well, that's Maurice Philippe. Um, it may or may not have been connected, but unfortunately, uh, Maurice Philippe took his own life a few years later. Mm. Was it the machine shop? We couldn't drill the holes right through the shafts, uh, but we didn't tell anybody because, you know, they'd yell at us or we didn't have any line of communication or whatever. Nobody wrote down a report, nothing of the sort. Um, so they decided, oh, well, we'll just do it our way and drill the holes from both ends. Stress riser in the middle of the shaft, shaft breaks, driver gets killed. Obviously, some blame has to lie there. Was the race mechanics? I mean, the race mechanics had seen the issues with the car. They'd seen the issues with the shaft. They'd been in they'd been in uh, Austria, saw uh, saw Miles shaft break, listened to Miles tell them what had gone wrong once it was inspected, uh, and proceeded to fit the same shafts back to the car. Again, there was no communication. I mean, 1970 telephones did exist. It wouldn't have been too difficult to get on the telephone to the uh, to the factory in the, in the UK and say send sets of solid shafts to Monza so we can fit them for the for the uh, Italian Grand Prix. Didn't happen. Okay. Was Jochen Ritter fault? Well, obviously he has to take some uh, has to take some responsibility because, after all, he didn't have to drive the car. I mean, he had to be aware of the issue with the shafts. Um, he had to be aware of the reasons why John Miles, who was an engineer and who understood things better than he did, why he wouldn't drive the car in in Monza. Uh, Yet he chose to drive the car. Uh, he was leading the world championship point score at that stage. He wanted to be world champion. And it's fairly well accepted that at the end of the year, he would be leaving Lotus anyway, and either retiring or going back to his friends at Brabham, a much safer car, much a much better environment for him. However, he chose to drive the car. And worse than that, he refused to wear crutch straps. They were the very early days of harnesses. You can see him here being strapped into the car. He refused to wear crutch straps. I think he had the idea that, um, you know, they, they, uh, he might get hurt, uh, you know, in an intimate way uh, in a crash. So he refused to wear them. However, the Italian court decided that the fault lay with the track workers and the circuit owners. Now that's interesting because why would they decide that? The problem was that the fence had not been laid correctly. You can see there the fence, the bolts are loose and the bits missing. This is actually a piece of the fence near where the, where the crash took place. So when, when uh, the car broke the drive shaft, it spewed off the road, hit the fence, slid down the fence until it came to this point. At this point, the, the fence speared out, cut the front off the car and damaged Rint, of course. But the car came to an abrupt stop, basically. Rint submarine down through the belts and the belt buckle and whatever uh, essentially broke his neck or whatever. So he, he, was, he was dead in the car. Uh, but the coroner in the court decided that the cause of Rint's death was the failure of the fence, which was what inflicted the, the fatal blow that killed him, uh, which is an interesting view of how Italian, um, Italian justice works. Interestingly, immediately after the crash, before the car had even been recovered, Chapman was already out of the country. He'd already had a few years before, back in 1961, uh, he'd had an issue with um, a fatal accident that one of his cars was involved in, at uh, also at Monza. Uh, uh, there were, I think, seven or eight or something spectators killed, and uh, the the the, uh, 
the lawsuits went on for years. The court was after him. He couldn't go to Italy. Uh, they wanted to arrest the driver. They wanted to seize the team. It was all sorts of drama. So Chapman skipped out of town. He ran away. Wasn't even, I guess, not even man enough to stand up and take responsibility for what had happened. Okay. As I've said here, though, the real cause of the accident was a total failure of communication involving all of the parties from the design of the car to the conclusion, to the time that the car hit the fence. Uh, engineers, as I've said, tend towards introversion. Introverts are usually not good communicators. So this parable hopefully should serve to illustrate the importance of communication at all levels. Like, for God's sake, talk to each other make notes, write things down, ensure that every member of your team knows what's happening with every other member of the team. And I'm not talking about the formula student team. I'm talking about the team of life uh, in family, in your work, in your career. When you move on, the importance of communication is really, really great. Okay. So what can we learn from this? I said, thanks for listening to my little history lesson. I hope you can benefit uh, in your future career. Remember, whatever can go wrong, so don't let it go wrong from the beginning. Um, before we talk about this, I'll talk about the, the crash. So the absolute, when, when, the, when the, uh, the brake shaft broke, the brake shaft broke on the right-hand front wheel. So the car had brakes on the left-hand front wheel, and so it turned hard to the left. It slid down the fence till it met, met the joint uh, where it wasn't properly bolted together. But also at that point, there was a post, like a, a, a vertical post on the inside. And beside the post, either an animal or spectators had actually dug a hole to enable them to get into the racetrack free either the animals had dug a hole or the or the or spectators had dug a hole so that they could crawl under the fence and and get to see the race for free of course the the wheel of the car dropped into that hole which literally stopped the car stone dead rent slid down into the car uh, his legs very badly damaged um, by the by the fence and the front part of the car being smashed away uh, and of course, he was he was um, fatally injured by the uh, by the by the seatbelts that he wouldn't that he wouldn't wear. Uh, a terrible, terrible situation. Like something nobody ever wants to see. Of course, the race went. Uh, practice went on. They didn't stop practice. The race went on. So, just a final little thing. I've said one final thing at the 1970 race. Jackie Eeks, um, another famous old race driver. He set a pole time of 1 minute 25.4 in his Ferrari. The cars in those days are three liter, normally aspirated, no turbochargers, uh, running on, on pump fuel. So he set a time of 1 minute 25.4. That's the, uh, that's the uh, Monza Autodrome as it was in 1970. So you can see it's flat out. So the crash happened at this crash site here at the, uh, the curve of Parabolica, now called something different, but you can see it's a closing radius, but you can imagine how fast they're going, basically a full tilt run down here at very high speed. And so that's where it all went wrong. Moving along, this year, Valtteri Bottas set pole position with a time of one minute 19.55 in his Mercedes. This is despite about eight additional corners being added to the circuit. So such is progress. So they're going six or seven seconds a lap quicker, despite having a lot more corners to go go through. Uh, so that's the track today. You can still see it's still the same shape, I guess, basically. But they've got the variantes here, like the Zorogia, the Redafilio, the Ascari, uh, and that's uh, basically chicanes designed to slow down the cars. And you can see in the middle of this, slow them down, so that reduces the uh, reduces the speed at the curve of Alboreto, as it's now called. That's right, Michele Alboreto is the one they're remembering. So, uh, however, of course, 
and time. They're, they're, they're going they're going faster here now than the, than the cars were in 1970. And that actually is down to the finish of where this presentation finishes, which is sort of one hour long. Whereas I've been given two hours to uh, to uh, to do this presentation. So. Uh, Andre, what do you want to do from here? I mean, I can present something else if you wish. Um, okay, I, I think it's uh, it's a good point to start with the question and answer session. Oh yeah, shit yeah, and uh, that's you know the questions and answers that ask whatever they like. Of course, as yeah. usual. Yeah, as usual. It's Pat, remember? <laughs> oh, of course. Um, the first question from my side, uh, um, do, uh, will you uh, switch on your video camera or you uh, switch off at... Uh, oh, didn't I have my... What, what have I got to do here? Have I been talking to you without a video? Now I have to figure this out. How do I figure this out? It's been okay. so long since I, since I used a Zoom thing. Hang on a minute. Pause share. Start video. There we go. Start video. Oh, yeah. look, who's yeah, that? It wasn't now the I... problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now. okay. But now it is. Yeah, if we want to talk to me, let me just close this thing down, I think. Uh, what do I want to do here? I want to, uh, actually, I just want to, how do I make this picture full size? Click on it. The first maybe questions, maybe some addings from my side uh, in, uh, about the machine shop and uh, this, say, uh, not correct manufacturing techniques. It, yeah. it can be interesting to see the drawings and uh, to know if they have a separate department to control the quality and uh, to measure the parts before they send it to the race team. <laughs> Obviously, you know, you're yeah. obviously you're talking about what happens in the current day. In those days, the the whole team probably had maybe uh, maybe thirty or forty people maximum. Um, lots of them were away at Indianapolis, or lots of them were away at, at the race meeting, or whatever. And the communication and and the the uh, the uh, what should we say the uh, the structure of how things worked were very different. So nothing, nothing like uh, control of of drawings and uh, stuff having to be signed off. It just happened, and in many cases there were no drawings; there were just sketches. Um, you know, I, I recall in a in a previous example of Chapman's behavior uh, back in the nineteen fifties, uh, there was an English make of Formula One car called Van Wall. And Van Wall were the first team to actually win the World Constructors Championship. That was 1956 or 50, 57, maybe. Anyway, they had in their development time they had uh, 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 issues of, of uh, ch chassis issues, making the car handle, and they called in Chapman as an expert, and uh, he arrived there one day dressed in a three-piece suit and tie, called all the engineers in, spent a day with them uh, talking to them about space frames and uh, drew some pictures and, and whatever and said, okay, away, walked away. So uh, basically, although if you look up the history of Van Wall, you will see that Colin Chapman is, uh, is uh, nominated as the chassis designer of the, of the championship winning car. In fact, he didn't design the chassis at all. He gave a talk to the engineers, um, drew some sketches, gave them a few ideas, uh, showed them pictures of some of, uh, some of the, the Lotus cars and left them to it. They designed their own chassis. So that was his way of doing things. There was no, you know, one would think if they called in Lotus to design a chassis for the Van Wall, that they would have designed a chassis in total, you know, the chassis and suspension and all the other things. But that's not really what happened at all. It just came along, had a talk with them, and that was basically the way things happened. I mean, Van Wall probably didn't have any more than 50 people either. So we've obviously learned from that. And, and as you're well aware, 
uh, from your own experience, uh, how many people were in the Renault team when you worked with them? It's about uh, 400 uh, <laughs> at the factory. Yeah, um, exactly. So, and, and nowadays, it's probably even more than that. So, <laughs> so you have uh, sufficient uh, people and whatever. The other thing, of course, remember this is way before CAD. So everything was on drawing boards and, uh, and, and uh, using slide rules for calculations, uh, books of logarithmic tables and all that stuff. It was a very, very different time. And as I said, less people, far, far, far less people and far less educated people. I mean, you have to say in those days, um, uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a university degree was a very rare thing. I think of my, uh, my uh, graduation from high school, matriculation, I think only two of us actually went to university. That was just, I mean, that was, you know, about, uh, what was that? that was about six, early, early 1960s. But uh, just, that just wasn't, it just wasn't, things were different back then. We, things have changed a lot. So I think it's unfair to, to judge what was happening at the team against, uh, against modern, uh, against, you know, the modern situation, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, what happened at Lotus in particular was disgraceful. If, um, if you move across to say another team in the UK at the same time, the Brabham team, and the Brabham team was managed or run designer by a, a, a gentleman by the name of Ron Toronak. And uh, Toronak was totally different. Um, Toronak uh, was, they called him Anorak, uh, you know, rhyming sl slang with Toronak because he was always on your back like an Anorak uh, because like he always wanted to keep the loop closed and people always knew that if you were driving a Brabham race car or later on a Rolt, which was his next brand, uh, they're much, much safer cars than say a Lotus, much safer. Uh, and pretty well as fast, you know, the uh, Brabham's have won at Indy 500, they won world championships in those years. So it wasn't as if, um, it, you know, Ritz suggestion that, you know, added a little bit of weight uh, in the uh, in the interests of, of reliability is not a bad trade-off. And that's an interesting thing with formula because some judges are absolutely hard on, on teams keeping the weight to a minimum. And in many respects, like to add five kilos to a car to guarantee reliability, that's a better bet than having, uh, you know, the, 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 the engine fall out two laps from the end of the, uh, of the endurance event. Um, you know, you, you have to say, to, what's the old saying? To finish first, you first must finish. So, uh, you know, the, a good lesson there, but obviously Chapman didn't like listening to it, so it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, in, I also continue in terms of uh, the machining shop. Uh, I think it's a good practice to have the separate person who will check the quality. Oh, and, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And um, this shouldn't be involved in the manufacturing because uh, it uh, shouldn't have any subjective feeling about uh, what uh, he, he have done. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you need, um, uh, like, it needs to be an auditor of some description. Somebody needs to check that the, that, the, uh, that the work done in the machine shop actually does comply with the drawings or whatever. And sometimes you'll find that even something which may comply with the drawings may be built as designed. When you actually get that component in your hand and look at it, you think, oh, don't like the look of that. That's a bit of a stress riser here. I think maybe we should rethink that. You know yourself, like you have something in your hand. It's different to looking at a picture or a drawing. How many times have we heard the saying, oh, but it worked in CAD. 
<laughs> yes. Okay, so, uh, the other moment I think uh, that students uh, should, let's say, should remember about the story because uh, when they go on a practice track, if uh, something uh, wasn't checked properly and uh, the driver is not confident, they should not test the car. Because sometimes I saw the teams who are just say, oh, we will hope it will work and just close their eyes. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, you know, the, you, you have to, it also underlines the importance of needing time because if you go to do some testing, so you've got a list of tasks that you want to do testing. And when you get to item two on the list, something goes wrong. And common sense tells you that you should not continue from this point. Then to think, oh, it'll be right and keep going because, because we need to check this other stuff. That can be catastrophic. You know, that could ruin your whole, ruin your whole event as well as maybe hurt somebody uh, the uh the team are aware i hope that we have actually had some drivers quite seriously injured in testing formula student cars um we had one case in uh, in scotland it's about 10 years ago now where the team were testing at a at a at it was at a racetrack but the facility wasn't really suitable. Uh, something broke on the car. The car hit the Armco fence and actually went, it was like, uh, like Grosjean actually went through the fence and the, the driver suffered uh, life-changing head injuries. Uh, you know, his life was ruined. Uh, you know, suffered, suffered a bad concussion, which has is, which is, which is ruined his life. So, I mean, these things do happen. Nobody nobody wants them to happen but somebody made a decision to run there somebody made a decision like i don't know what the story is about that but but the situation is the same that you know the, the driver and in that case like a young man who hadn't even started his life he was a you know a, an engineer study or a, a student studying engineering at a university in scotland and you know spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair or something these things do happen. Go. Mm -hmm. Anyone got any questions? Of course, yes. Let's look at the beginning of the presentation. How do you think, uh, what is the optimal ratio of intolerance and excellence in the team? Uh, can you repeat that question for me, Andre? I just invite uh, him to come closer. Hello. Hello how there, you... how are you? <laughs> are how you behaving? You... <laughs> Go on. What is the optimal ratio of extroverts and introverts in the team? <laughs> Ask a psychologist, I don't know. <laughs> you don't sound introverted to me. <laughs> you don't sound like an introvert to me. <laughs> Um, you know, you need a look, you know, would you have an introvert do, uh, do your presentation at Formula Student? Of course you wouldn't. You want somebody who's got the ability to, to do presentation. Even, even uh, uh, the presentation to the judges at your, uh, at your, in the design competition, it's best if you have somebody who's a transmitter rather than a receiver. Uh, I had a situation once uh, in the Australian competition where I was trying to talk to a young engineer about their particular design, and he literally he literally couldn't talk to me. He was that shy. There, there were several things. First of all, he was obviously a, a very introverted young man, and secondly, I think you know, oh good gracious, it's Pat Clark, the famous Formula student judge. How can I talk to him? which is not the case at all. Anybody who talks to me knows I'm easy to talk to. But he was that shy, he couldn't. And I kept answering, asking him some questions about why he had designed certain things. And he literally just couldn't tell me. And the sad part was, I already knew the answer. And when the scoring came, of course, that 
cost the team dearly in the design event. And I had to explain to their, uh, their uh, advisor that, uh, that that team would have in fact won design had they been able to explain their design to the judges. So it was the mistake that that team made was choosing the wrong people uh, for, the, for the design event um, or not training or not preparing their particular people to be able to do it properly. So, you know, there are levels of introversion and, and extroversion, and, and I guess there are people in between, but what the balance, what the best balance is, heaven only knows. You'd have to, you'd have to ask a psychiatrist or a psychologist about that, and that's not me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But think about what the good thing is you're thinking about it. Obviously, yeah. Do you think that um, that I've sort of touched a point that may be important in your team? Yeah. We all have to understand what other people do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ребята, вопросы можно задать любые, касающиеся в том числе и конструкции шасси, потому что, несмотря на то, что презентация была немножко не про инженерную часть, человек является достаточно опытным судьей, как вы помните, и опытным инженером. Again, I need a translation for a... Everyone thinking about the questions. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> Just a, a, a question for the group in in, uh, in general. How important do they think it is uh, for formula student to uh, to advance uh, vehicle technology in the world to push to push the design uh, the design boundaries forward? Do you do you think that's the intent of uh, a formula student? Because it's not. <laughs> the point I'm going to, to make here is that the intent of formula student is to um, to to give the the young graduate engineers and the other people who are involved essentially a finishing school uh, for their education. We found that uh, you know the universities are not providing uh, sufficient hands-on stuff. You know they're theory heavy and practically. Shy, and this this is maybe not the uh, not the university's fault. That's the way the structure is, but um, but to be to be useful in the real world, uh, you need to be able to know how to do stuff rather than know the idea behind it. And so we find that employees employers repeatedly tell us that. When they hire a formula student graduate, they actually hire a young engineer or a young project manager or whatever the case may be. Um, if they hire a young engineer or a young project manager who has not had formula student experience, they have to spend one or two years teaching them. So we've actually taken uh, a good chunk of their education of, um, of where the uh, where the, uh, the education is needed away from the universities or, or, or from the companies that hire them. And we're doing it in a project that's fun and interesting and people get excited about. There's no excuse or no, uh, it's no, uh, at, at Formula SAE in, uh, in the US, and I know Andre's been there and probably seen this, uh, the SpaceX people, Elon Musk, thing, they actually send a whole group of uh, uh, personnel, uh, like people, and they actually hire straight from the competition. Uh, they come to people like myself and Steve Fox and other senior judges, and they actually ask for references, point out to us who the good guys or the good girls are. Um, so because they know the head start that we've given them, and I recall a few years ago when Claude Ruel and I visited SpaceX in Los Angeles, um, 
the number of young faces that we recognized, the number of young people who waved and said, hi, Claude, hi, Pat, was unbelievable. Like there must have been 20 of them, maybe more. And they're all there building rocket ships, like, you know, rocket ship engineers, you know. Uh, so it, it really, so formula student is achieving its, um, achieving its intent there. What I don't like to see is to have teams subverted, particularly by sponsors who want them to develop new technology or something like that, because that's research and that's, that's a different thing. What we want to teach the, the students is about real world engineering, real world project management, real world, how to get on and do it. It's not necessary to, uh, to uh, develop products to improve the world. I'm not against improving the world, not at all. Just do it in another place and another time. It's important to question. Uh, Andre, when is your uh, when is your competition? What's the date for your competition? Mm, sorry, sorry, say again. What What's the date for Formula Student, Russia? Uh, you mean uh, for the next year? In next year, yes. Uh, it should be the first week uh, first weekend of September. Okay, yeah. So hopefully COVID and everything will be all long gone by then. Um, yeah, I hope and we, so. and we can get we can get back to we can get back to doing it properly. Uh, it's been very frustrating because good as these Zoom conferences are, they're not the same as face to face. The real thing, um, you know, that works so much better. Yeah, of course. And yeah, we have the question. Go. <laughs> Uh, hello, Mr. Clark. Uh, I'm no, 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 no. Hey, no, hold on, hold on. Mr. Clark was my father. I'm Pat. Pat, <laughs> that's okay. That's great. Hello, Pat. Yeah. Yes. I'm Vladislav. I represent uh, North Capital Motorsport team from uh, Which? St. Petersburg. <coughs> North Capital yep. Motorsport, St. Pete. Yeah. From St. Pete. Yep. Okay. Uh, yesterday we uh, had a talk with. Uh, Esslingen from a student team yeah. about vehicle dynamics. And uh, yeah. they told us that they uh, don't use any specific uh, software for the development of their car. They uh, use their own handwritten program yep. with um, addition of some uh, FEA software. Yep. And, uh, uh, I would like to hear uh, your thoughts on th that topic. Do you think that some software uh, like uh, Adam's car is important for the development of the car or no. is it? No, 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 I don't. Um, in fact, uh, I think it would be possible to design and build a competitive Formula student race car without the use of any software whatsoever. Now, you might need to use some FEA, FEA uh, software in order to determine uh, the, the, the forces and the loads and the, you know, to make sure that it's able to, uh, able to do the job that you're not going to break it, like calculate the forces and whatever. But um, simply, you know, you need, you need to design a, a chassis that is stiff enough to do the job. How stiff should it be? Well, the rule of thumb for a Formula student car, remember a Formula student car is not a heavy, a heavy ground effect car. They're never going to develop much uh, aero downforce because the real estate or the, the, the area of the car is just too small. Um, so you're never going to have a car which needs to be horrendously stiff like a Formula One car or a Formula Three car. And a good rule of thumb is that the chassis stiffness, the installed stiffness, that's to say stiffness measured hub to hub with struts instead of, um, instead of uh, uh, springs, should be one order of magnitude greater than the roll stiffness, okay? So in other words, it doesn't need to be terribly stiff, you know, maybe 2,500 Newton meters per degree or something like that. Okay, secondly, the suspension travel by the, law, by the rules of the book need to be 
50 millimeters minimum. No need for it to be any more than that, okay? And in fact, if I were allowed, I'd have zero droop on the front, but that's another story for another day somewhere else. Uh, so how much uh, articulation are you going to have in wheel angles over only 50 millimeters of wheel travel? Answer is not very much. So you look at your tire data and you look either from testing, you can test this yourself or read the data or whatever. Have a look at the operating window for your tire's camber angles. You know, so if this tire operates best between say negative one and negative four, that gives you a three degree window or it might be from zero to negative two, that gives you a two degree window. That's the best spot. What you then do is you need to design um, suspension, uh, which will give you, will keep the tire within that window. Doesn't have to be exactly two degrees or three degrees or whatever, you just need to keep it in that window. Remember that you have a big squishy thing between your car and all your carefully calculated, all your carefully calculated uh, uh, geometry. Uh, it's called a tire, you know, which, you know, the sidewalls flex or whatever. Now, an example would be if you sit in the car, uh, you can, with the car stationary, just sitting on the, on the floor, you can actually turn the steering wheel significantly to the left and to the right without moving the contact patch of the tire at all just purely from compliance to the sidewall of the tire. Uh, secondly, uh, if you apply some common sense design, like for instance, if you can imagine that you're applying a lateral force to the car, you're in a high speed corner, the car is rolling to the outside, the tire is loaded to 99.9% .9 of its maximum availability to to absorb the load. However, the suspension movement is trying to push that tire away from the car because of the, the track of the wheel. You've now just exceeded 100% of the tire's ability to grip. And so it's not going to contribute to the best cornering force. So how do you address that? Well, you start off by making sure that your lower control arms are as long as practical horizontal to the ground, okay? Now, that means that no matter what else you do, regardless of something completely and utterly stupid, your roll centers are going to end up somewhere in the right place and whatever, so I never even worry about that stuff. You know, you're looking at the, 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 uh, the answer to good handling is to keep the tire happy at the contact patch. Any vibration that you, uh, that you apply um, is going to, to basically break the grip of the tires. If I were there, maybe I can show you in the window. I've got in my hand, just let me pull this off. Okay, I've got in my hand a pencil, just an ordinary, oops, where is it? Yeah, ordinary pencil. And it's got a rubber eraser on the end of it. You see this? Okay, now, if I stand that on my iPhone, Okay, oops, and I lean it over a little bit and apply a vertical pressure, it holds. But if I give the phone a tap, it will break away and lose grip immediately because the, the vibration has broken the, the, uh, the reaction between the rubber and the eraser and the smooth surface on the, on the phone. So you want to keep your tire as happy as possible. And that means that you need to consider suspension geometry, which will do that. Um, if you look at any Formula One car, for instance, they, they don't pay any attention to suspension geometry. It's just a matter of keeping the, keeping the tires right and keeping uh, not interfering with the aerodynamics. Hello there. That's better. How did that happen? Let me make that bigger. Yeah. Okay. So um, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Oh, yeah. So that brings back important things like, uh, do you balance the wheels on your race car? Mm, no. <laughs> do you balance the wheels on your race car? <laughs> you do balance. 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 You balance them, spin them up and balance them. Yep. Mm, many teams don't. How important do you think that is? 
Now, I'll make it even more important. How important do you think it is in the wet? When if you have the, 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 tire, uh, the tire vibrating on the, uh, on the road surface, it actually is opening little entries for the lubricant, the water, the rain to get between the tire and the road surface and reduce the grip. How important is it therefore that your wheel is actually turning about the actual center, that it's concentric, that it's rolling true. So the wheel needs to be fitted onto a spigot to center it. Uh, it's, uh, it's not good design to, to center your wheels by just using the wheel nuts because it may not actually be in the middle, in which case it will develop a, a, a vibration which, um, which reduces the grip. And like just interesting little, little side story. You know, if you drive your road car uh, without, with the wheels unbalanced, what happens? You have the, 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 the balance weight falls off the front wheel of your road car. What happens? You reach about 100 kilometers an hour, and all of a sudden the steering wheel starts shaking. If you go faster, it stops shaking. And if you go slower, it stops shaking. So do you think the imbalance has gone away? Why do you think the car shakes, the steering wheel shakes at 100 kilometers an hour? It's because that's when the frequency of the imbalance in the wheel resonates with the frequency of the springs that the car is riding on. When you get out of frequency, it doesn't happen anymore. But is the vibration at the wheel still there? Of course it is. Of course it is. Um, so important to, to ensure that, that, uh, that wheels are balanced. Lots of, lots of simple things. You'll find that uh, you know, by keeping stuff regular and symmetrical and feeding forces at right angles and all that sort of stuff, all makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, another example would be ensuring that, uh, that your drive shafts are of equal length or are balanced in their uh, torque absorption capability. Uh, I recall watching a car in the UK uh, from one of the German teams in the acceleration event in the wet. It had a long drive shaft on one side and a short drive shaft on the other side because the differential was not in the middle of the car. The driver excel now it, at the UK event, the acceleration event is up along the pit wall. So there's a wall on one side, it's up along the pit wall. So the driver dropped the clutch and accelerated hard. And of course the long axle actually wound up more than the short axle. The driver counteracted this torque steer by subtly increasing the well, actually went the other way, increased the steering angle. When he reached the end of the, core, the, the acceleration event, he closed the throttle. The torque that was stored in the, in the long axle unwound and steered the car straight into the wall, knocked the front corner off. End of the event for them. That was the finish. Okay, so just simple stuff. To demonstrate that, a lesson that I'd learned long, long, long time ago I had to travel on a plane across Australia from Sydney to Perth. It's like, like you guys going to the UK or farther than Moscow. And uh, I had to take a limited slip differential from a car, a rear wheel drive car. Um, the limited slip differential that I had had a crown wheel attached to it. You know? So I had to take that crown wheel off because it's extra weight to carry on the plane. Um, I got a, an air rattle gun and a 50 millimeter uh, torque driver, couldn't loosen the bolts. Went to a 25 millimeter torque bit, oh, they all came straight out because the torque was being wasted in the longer, in the longer, so you think, oh, it's not important, but it is so important. You know, that's, you have to think about the, the little stuff. All right, just a, just a little story from Pat's experiences. Um, who's here who's not um, part of engineering or design? Do we have, do we have anybody in the class who's, uh, you know, promotional or commercial or costing or? Who, uh, how, many, how many team leaders? How many team leaders do we have? Uh, yes. Who would like 
to have hello pinky <laughs> yeah. yeah who would like some advice on uh, on raising sponsorship money raising sponsorship everybody <laughs> yeah i believe it's everybody yeah i believe it's everybody okay let me tell you a little story and what's triggered this is how the last speaker the last question introduced himself he said he was from uh, whatever it was race team I forget at the moment um when you go when you go to talk to a potential sponsor do not announce yourselves as you know the moscow uh, race team or uh, uh St. Petersburg Motorsport or any of those sort of names. And do not wear clothing that has motorsport themes on it. Okay. Now, the reason I say this is because every marketing manager on the planet every week gets applications from people saying, dear sir, please give me some money to spend on my race car or my motorbike or my speedboat or whatever the case may be. And it just ends up in the bin because there is nothing in it for the company. So for the company to help you, first of all, motorsport is not a good, like they, many, many, not only do people not like motorsport, but some people actually physically detest it. They see it as a waste of the, the world's resources or whatever. So my advice to you would be this, that you tell them that you are representing your university in an international engineering challenge and that you would like some help. Now, the first thing from a, from a psychological point of view, I know I said I'm not a psychologist, but I will tell you this, that if you look somebody directly in the eye and openly and honestly ask them for some help for a worthwhile product for project, it is almost impossible for them to say no. They may not be able to give you what you're asking for, but they will find something. You know, one example uh, in, uh, in India was a team went to a company and, and asked, and, the, and the, the, the man they spoke to said, look, I don't have any budget. I cannot help you. I'm so sorry. However, what I can do is I can loan you one of my company trucks to take your car to the event and bring it back. Now, this team were at least a thousand kilometers away from the event. So how useful do you think that little bit of sponsorship was? Uh, you know, it was not what they asked for, but it certainly helped. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, if, if, you ask, if you ask a company for help for something uh, like, you know, advancing, advancing technology or whatever the case may be that you're doing, that's a feel good thing for the company. You may think, oh, this is like, I'm being a good neighbor. I'll sort of help the students because it advances, you know, advances the cause of, of Mother Russia and all the other things that sounds good. But not only that, it may well be, and you're not even supposed to know about this, but it may well be that there is actually a tax advantage for him to do so. It may well be that he can write off anything that he gives to you for that straight off his his uh, his um, taxable income and reduce the tax burden on his company. Uh, however, there probably isn't if he says he's going to give some money to some guy to build a race car. So even though motorsport and motor racing and whatever is the theme for Formula Student, uh, there are times and places when you're best off to just shut up about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, gotta, you gotta think smart. Any more questions? We've got 25 minutes to go, you know? <laughs> Unless you want an early break. Who has their who has their car for next year? The design finalized. Anybody got their design finalized for next year? Sorry, Peter. 
Hello, hello. Hello, Pat. My name hello. is Vladimir. I'm from Will the US. Uh, from from where? The US. Where are you? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Last year, our team uh, started to build uh, uh, electrical vehicle. And yeah. uh, there is a problem uh, with communication between uh, mechanical engineer <laughs> and uh, electrical engineers. Yeah, and they don't like each other. They don't like uh, each other. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, we like from other worlds. And uh, how to com communicate uh, uh, people from different uh, engineering uh, directions. Um, again, I'm not a psychologist, but it is most definitely a, 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 a something that you've got to address. When we first started the, the EV competition, the electric competition in, in Germany, 10 years or something ago now, we actually had mechanical engineers just I'm not going to catch anything. <laughs> we actually had mechanical engineers walk away from the team, not interested in electric cars. Not yeah, that's it's the way the way a mechanical engineer's brain works is different to the way an electrical engineer's brain works. They're just different people. So it is a very definite, uh, very definite, and I would say not an unusual situation. It is actually a usual situation that happens everywhere. I'm sure you'll find that if you ask the other teams, they'll tell you the same the same situation. What that means is that it's a matter that you have to address right up front. Like you've got to, you've got to make sure that the electrical engineers understand and the mechanical engineers understand, and that somehow if you're going to make this project work, you must find a way to work together. Uh, you must learn to respect each other. Um, but also co communication is difficult because sometimes they talk different languages. Um, but the bottom line is that, you know, I, when I talk about this, I say, if you're talking about, um, uh, you know, electrical energy, it's no different to mechanical energy. You know, with mechanical energy, you, you've got to do some work. You get, you know, if you want to calculate power, you've got to have force and motion and, and work done well the same sort of thing with electrical you got to push those electrons down the down the uh, down the wire and, and and make something happen at the other end it's it really is essentially the same thing but you're talking about it from two different two different perspectives but it is a problem it needs uh it needs um as i said it, it certainly before you even started i think you need to uh, get the uh, the people involved together in a meeting and discuss only that issue, the matter of communication and cooperation between the electrical engineers and the mechanical engineers and how you're going to make it work. Uh, otherwise, it won't work, as, as you're finding out. It's, uh, you know, they, they, they just don't like each other. However, you've got to, you've got to overcome that. Um, there really is no more advice I can give you on that. That's, uh, it's just a natural thing. It's like, uh, it's like the old joke about the two apples hanging on a tree. And one apple said to the other apple, he said, uh, you know, if the world was run by apples, there'd be no troubles. There'd be no black versus white. There'd be no East versus West. We'd have no fights. There'd be no problems like that at all. And the second apple said, red apples or green apples? Uh, okay. Green apples. <laughs> you, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, in other words, the, 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 the divide is always there. The split is always splayed. And in, in the case of in the case of the uh, the engineers, you know, which uh, we'll call the we'll call the electrical engineers the red apples, and the mechanical engineers the green apples. No, no, the, red, the electricals want to be green, don't they? Yeah, they'll be the green apples. The mechanical engineers will be the red apples, and uh, we've got to uh, blend them together and uh, have some red and green apples. No more, I can tell you. Okay, thank. No problems at all.
that's me. Oh, hello, hello, hello. That's a familiar face. <laughs> yes. Go. Um, uh, you asked uh, about uh, fi finalized projects and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got one on our hands for the yeah. combustion vehicle. Yeah. And we are waiting for the our metalworks sponsor to begin the production. Yep. And, and uh, how? Oh no! I was just just curious to know how it's how it's going. How it's, what uh, is is your uh, is your combustion car? Is it a, a new design, or is it a development of a previous design? Mm. It um, it is strongly based on the previous car. Yeah, we you got uh, some harsh times harsh times in our team for the past three years. Uh, there, oh, I haven't, I haven't seen your car for nearly three years. <laughs> yeah, what was yeah. I? Was I very critical? Was I? I can't remember the car. Uh, it yeah. barely changed <laughs> for for since you last seen it because they got serious leak of uh, intelligence, it, and and uh, there are strong communication problems. Uh, we've got uh, our captain and our head engineers uh, have been having uh, arguments uh, during all the, all, all of the team meetings. Uh, there's no way we we can develop anything good in, in a year. Yeah. You you need a a, a new. Uh, a new uh, team captain. Now, I don't know if Mr. Vladimir Putin is available, but <laughs> that's what you need. You need definitely need a strong a strong manager to, to manage the team. Um, I've never seen a successful Formula student team that didn't have a strong personality uh, manager. And sometimes, uh, you know, not unsurprisingly, but in, in several cases, that's actually been a woman. Uh, you know, like, a, you know, to, believe me, women can be extremely positive and good managers. Uh, but uh, it is important that you need a manager who can keep it on, on the rails. And argument and fighting and poor communication within the team is exactly the shit that I was talking about when I was talking about Yoko and being killed. Uh, you know, like, can you imagine if... Um, if somebody uh, uh, screwed up left, right, and center, and God help us and all, but we lost uh, your uh, Max Verstappen tomorrow, can you imagine the the reaction? Like to be a worldwide explosion, but that's basically what happened. You know, the, the, the guy he went on fortunate, well, fortunately, I guess uh, he went on to he had enough points to uh, rent. This is. To win the championship, so he was, an, so he's fortunately the only posthumous, like, deceased world champion that, that we've ever had. But, but lost primarily because of communication failures everywhere. Communication failures at the design. Communication failures at the race. Communication failures at fitting the fence. The judge in in Italy determined that the fault lay with the organize with the. Uh, with the owners of the racetrack because they didn't teach the people how to build a fence properly. Who would you have blamed? I'd have hey. had that bastard, I'd have had that bastard Chapman hang <laughs> I'd have had him in jail. Incidentally, do you know how do you know how he ended up? Just a, a story. He uh, he got involved with um, John DeLorean. You know this name? You know the DeLorean car, Back to the Future? Okay. And they were involved with um, uh, the whole thing was, you, you, I don't know whether you're aware, but eventually they caught DeLorean and put him in jail for cocaine smuggling because that's what it was all about. They'd ripped off uh, the, the UK government. The UK government uh, had, there were issues in the north of Ireland, which is part of England, uh, with massive unemployment. And so they came to the UK government and promised that we're going to build a factory and build these cars, these radical stainless steel cars, and we're going to employ 
lots of people, but we need money from the government. So the government gave millions of pounds, which they just traded on the cocaine market. <laughs> anyway, when it, uh, when it got to, uh, to court eventually, um, Colin Chapman was dead. He died in very nasty circumstances. Uh, he died in a hotel with a woman who wasn't his wife. Okay, don't need to go any further into that. But when it got to court, the judge said that if Mr. Chapman was here, he most assuredly would be looking at a lengthy jail sentence. So he was just a dishonest, just a dishonest, immoral person. Yeah. And unfortunately, of course, anybody been to Formula Student Austria? Because if you go to Formula Student Austria, at the racetrack there, they've actually got a memorial for York and Rint, uh, like a, a statue, or a statue and a, and a thing for York and Rint. Tell you who he, he uh, his best friend and somebody he raced with was Dr. Helmut Marko. Do you know that name? Helmut Marko from the Red, from the Red Bull team? He's the, he's the guy who hires and fires all the drivers. Dr. Dr. Marco, yeah, he's an old gray-haired guy, like me, you know, an old gray-haired guy. He hires and fires. Well, they raced together uh, back in the, in the 70s or whatever the case may be. But yeah, so small world we live in. But, uh, you know, going back to the original presentation, I said, you know, to, to learn about the future, you need to understand about the past. That's why um, I make no apologies for dragging up this stuff, you know, when I was your age this stuff was state of the art and mistakes were made back then that unfortunately we're still making today, you know, because we haven't learned from the lessons of the past. So that's why I talk about them. All right, look, what are you gonna do? Um, how involved is your faculty advisor? You have a faculty advisor at the university? We don't have one. Okay, he doesn't care about the car and the competition, or he doesn't care about what the team are doing, because uh, he might only, be uh, stuff like yeah. he he only signs documents and he. Okay, not... he's the right he's the right guy. You need you need to organize a meeting with him. You just organize a meeting with him and explain to him what you're explaining to me, and ask him to chair a meeting between these people and lay down the rules. This is the way it's gonna be. Like, you know, he's, it not, he's not interfering at all or interest at all in the manufacture of the car or the competition or any of that sort of stuff. But it's just a group, like a student, a student project that he's responsible and it's out of control. It's out of control because you have communication issues. So he's the person who should come in and say, now listen, because, I mean, he has the ultimate threat. He can say, if you guys don't get your act together, I'm going to stop this happening. That might be just what you need to, but that's the person. The other thing is that it's not, see, if you, the problem, if you try to fix it within the, the team, it's always going to be one side against the other side, or they only said that because whatever. But when it's somebody from the outside, like a neutral person who comes in and lays down the law and points out what needs to be fixed and what needs to be changed within this team for it to work, to move forward. Um, it's accepted by both people equally. Make sense? You've got yes. a little job. You've got a little job to do. Of course. <laughs> you have a little uh, job to do. Uh, our head engineer left us. Yeah, uh, because of this? Because of this, yes. Yeah. Well, again, uh, you need to, make, yeah. So who's the head engineer now? Problem solved itself. Ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, we yeah. Just to figure out who who should be our next uh, yeah. head engineer and uh, that's yeah. it. And move the on from there. Pretty good right now. Yeah. And we are looking for our future events. Yep. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We are good now. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, also, uh, there is um, 
uh, hard uh, task for us. Our one of our main sponsors wants us to present uh, electric vehicle uh, the future event uh, at FS Russia 2022. Yeah. Yep. And we. Have don't want to, you don't want to do it. <laughs> we don't want uh, to lose our sponsor because uh, yeah. yeah, yes. it strongly involved. Yeah, but, uh, but asking, this all, yeah, this also is a very, this also is a very very common problem. Uh, well, um, and it and you, it go, but, I said, whoops, hang on, let me just. How's that? Is that better? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, now the can. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. This, this, this is a very, it's okay now? This is, this is actually a very common problem, right up to, in fact, the competitions themselves, where we have sponsors dictating what they want, um, rather than accepting what the competition is, uh, they want, uh, you know, the classic, uh, the classic thing is uh, at the German competition, the sponsors demanding that they have a driverless competition, because the sponsors like Mahler, well, the companies that, that sponsor the German competition, they want to uh, have the the young brains at university do research on driverless on driverless cars, which saves them, you know, yeah. So, oh, and we've had particularly the. Um, particularly with electric cars, because companies who are thinking, oh, electric cars are the way of the future. And so we want to be involved in that. And I would disagree that electric cars are the way of the future, uh, or not as we understand them. Um, I think you'll find that, uh, you know, eventually, once we get there, we will be talking about uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, Meanwhile, I, I really, I, like if you want to keep this, how important a sponsor is this? Uh, I think it's essential. Mm. Well, you have to make a decision to, uh, to uh, stop, exist stop its existence. Without yeah. It. yeah, I think you have to do what, you know, you're gonna to have to do what they want you to do, unfortunately. Um, but I would make sure that they understand your your position, that uh, it, they understand that you know the object of Formula Student is not to develop new technology and to save the world and clean up the environment and do all the other things, uh, but uh, but to to actually finish off the education and to teach your young graduates about project management and engineering and all the other thing, time management, all the other things that, that you're learning. Um, and whether that's by building a, a new cement mixer or a, a little race car is immaterial. And whether that race car is powered by electricity or powered by gasoline is also immaterial. It doesn't matter. Um, it's uh, it's the, the, project, the project is what the project is. Um, you know, we chose back when we started this thing back in the in the 1980s, we chose a little race car. It was originally called Mini Indy, like Mini in the States, like Mini Indy cars, uh, because people got excited about race cars. Now we're more than a generation later, generation is 30 years, and we're a 96, 96, 16, yeah, so we're nearly 40 years down the road. Uh, the youth of today are not necessarily driven by the same things as drove the youth of 40 years ago, uh, because interests have changed, the, the environment has changed, the world has changed, and uh, now we need to make, uh, make the world sort of more, you know, make, the make, a, make the competition more attractive to the students that we want to have involved. So for this reason, um, I think you know there is a place for for the electric competition, and there's also a place for the for the uh, the driverless competition, because you're always going to have students who are involved in uh, machine learning and robotics and all the other things that you need for driverless cars. Uh, however, I don't think the event 
should be held at the same place on the same date as formula student. Uh, it's because it's an event for different people in a different place, in a different time. And the, the Chinese understand this. I don't know whether you're aware, but the Chinese, they have two events. They're six months apart. They're thousands of kilometers apart. One is pure electric. The other one is pure uh, internal combustion. You know, so, um, because you, know, you, you go to an event where you've got mixed electric and, and it's difficult to score them. Um, you know, there's always arguments about uh, energy use and all the other, the other things. Um, the, uh, the electric cars, if they're done properly, are always going to be much faster in the short events, like acceleration, mm -hmm. whatever. However, because of, of battery life, they can't maintain that speed advantage. And so the IC cars become better for the, the endurance event. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's those green and uh, red and yellow, apple, red and green apples again, but different apples. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Good luck with, no, no dramas. Incidentally, um, I might even get to Andre to write this down. Guys, don't feel, uh, shy about emailing me if you want particular advice or you want to ask a question and i'll give you the world's easiest email address okay it's pat.clark at email.com that's a good email address isn't it? <laughs> yeah i have that email address so uh, so feel free to email me if you've got questions or you need some help or advice or a shoulder to cry on <laughs> not a problem at all okay that's a lot of information to process. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Okay, good luck. And Thank hopefully you. we'll see you in September. Yeah. Actually, there's an old song, I'll see you in September. <laughs> Don't matter. <laughs> Don't matter. You. Yeah, okay. Hang in there. Yep. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. I think it's... I think it's nearly time for morning tea, isn't it? Time for a coffee break. Yeah, so uh, well, yeah. just ended Did, actually. And it seems like uh, no more questions so far. Yeah. Um, just uh, jot down jot down so they can write that email address if they want to talk to me. It's pat.clark at email.com. It's a good email yeah, address. <laughs> it's easy. Yeah, easy, real easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will wish you all good luck and hopefully see you in uh, in September. Uh, all things being hopefully, COVID will be well and truly over and done with, and we'll be back to normal and uh, get back to uh, get back to uh, life as it was as we know it. I think actually, I don't think things are ever going to be the same again. I think I think COVID has changed the world a little bit forever. At least we will start using Zoom everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yay. So I've had my two COVID shots. And uh, uh, because of my age, I'm, uh, I'm in line for a third booster shot in uh, about another month. So I'm not particularly worried about COVID again at this stage. So we'll see how we go. OK, Andre, as usual, lovely talking to you. But I mean, we keep in touch on. Facebook yeah. or something anyway. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. And uh, like, thank the, uh, thank the students for their attention and, and uh, questions and whatever, and hope it all, hope it all goes well. So you have, uh, you have 20 something students there. Do you have uh, many Zoom attendees? You have people from other places or is it just, just this? It's just on, on site event, but we will okay. share the video later. Okay, no problems. Um, yeah, uh, if if you want to that uh, that uh, document the PDF document I sent you, is share that around if you wish. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. If somebody somebody wants yes. a copy, they can have that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I've had fun. I hope everybody else has, and uh, see you next time. We maybe have to do another one sometime. <laughs> do one in Moscow. Yeah, we hope so. A big thank you to you, Pat. And yeah. My, really my pleasure. You. Yeah. 
you know, formula student Russia is unfinished business for me anyway. So, <laughs> all right. Business for us also. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, guys and girls, bye-bye. So long, see you soon.